Since the one-time transfer rule and the transfer portal has changed the landscape of college football, there may not be a school in the country that has used it to their advantage more than the University of Texas. You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked on College for $20 off your first purchase. On today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, we are discussing the transfer success the University of Texas has had under Steve Sarkeesian. In the second segment, we just watched UConn win back to back national championships in college basketball. The first time that's been done since Kevin Durant was in college. <laughs> so it's been a long time and a very impressive feat for the UConn. Huskies and then in the last segment now that we've turned the page on a historic women's college basketball season can the Texas women's basketball team who was a one seed this year and made it to the elite eight get to the final four or championship game next season we discuss all of that and more on today's episode of locked on Longhorns part of the locked on podcast network your team every day so I've said you know, a bunch on here that, you know, I really just love Steve Sarkeesian, right? I love that, you know, obviously he's an awesome football coach, um, just in terms of the offensive side of the ball, what he's been able to do in terms of the transformation of this program, um, you know, how he's just such a good person. Everybody that you talk to or, or listen to talk about Steve Sarkeesian um, just talks about how he's a special person um, and how he serves as a mentor and a father figure to all of our Longhorns, right? All of our players, right? I, I know that they have the utmost respect and reverence for him. But outside of what he does on the football field, you know, once again, I just think he's a great person, period. Right. And it's so refreshing as a Texas fan to have somebody represent your program that's not only, you know, not only represents it the right way on the field of play, you know, because it doesn't have to be football. It can be basketball on the court, baseball on the diamond, et cetera, but also, you know, off the field of play represents the University of Texas at the highest level. And I think Steve Sarkeesian does that. And just him and his staff have so much wisdom. Um, and I just have so much respect and reverence for him and his staff. And, you know, I say it all the time when he talks, he, you know, when he talks, I listen. Um, when I watch his press conferences, I feel like I always learn something, you know, and one of my favorite sarcasms, I guess, was, you know, this past off season coming into the 2023 season, which was historic for the Longhorns. Um, he was talking about NIL and the one-time transfer rule and the transfer portal to Ryan Clark and, he mentioned the phrase adapt or die. And that's something that I've always associated with Steve Sarkeesian. And it's one of my favorite, you know, sarcasms, right? Adapt or die in this era of college football, right? In this era of NIL, you know, the one-time transfer rule, all of that to be successful, you have to utilize it to your advantage, right? Or you can just retire like Nick Saban. <laughs> he gets tired of it. But if you want to win at a high level in college football, you have to utilize the transfer portal and NIL to your advantage, regardless of how you feel about it. I'm sure there's a bunch of coaches in the portal right now right, that probably hate it. You know what I mean? Like there's a bunch of coaches negotiating NIL deals right now that probably hate it. Right. But if you want to win at the highest level in college football, adapt or die. We have seen programs like Texas and Oregon use it to their advantage. And they're some of the top programs in the sport, even Ohio State. Right. They recruit really well out of high school. But we see the transfer class they just brought in. Right. They've adapted. And then you see schools like Clemson who just three, four years ago was a premier program in the sport, but they've neglected NIL. They've neglected the transfer portal. And Dabo Sweeney being stubborn, right? I know he wanted to come out and say God is his NIL, right? You know, his, you know, um, his program is built through God's name, image, and likeness, right? You know, and I love that. You know, I'm spiritual myself, but that's not paying the players and that's not getting the high level players to come there, right? Clearly, Andrew Makuba didn't agree with him because he came to the University of Texas instead of finishing out at Clemson. So Dabo Sweeney's stubbornness, right and his unwillingness to adapt or to you know incorporate nil or the transfer portal in a high level in his program has completely removed clemson from the premier program conversation in college football right like nobody's worried about clemson nobody views clemson as a threat or a legitimate national championship contender adapt or die texas oregon programs like that have adapted programs like clemson have died, right? Because they've neglected the transfer portal, NIL, and the one-time transfer rule and the accessibility of these great players across the country. So this morning, I was reading an article from 24-7 Sports that was highlighting some of the best transfers that have entered the portal since 2022 or since the one-time transfer rule um, 
you know, and transfer portal really became a thing. And they did a list of the 14 highest rated transfers since then. And it had almost slipped my mind how much high end success Texas has had in the portal. Right. Of the 14 highest rated transfers since 2022, and I didn't just randomly pick 14. They did a list of 14. I'm not sure why they couldn't do 15. Um, but three of the 14 highest rated transfers since 2022 have committed to the University of Texas per an article by 24-7 Sports. That's over 20 percent. Right? That's pretty high. And of that list of 14, Alabama has three, although it's a little tricky. I'll talk about that in a second. Texas has three and Ohio State has two. So since the portal has taken off, right, Texas has brought in essentially the most high level talent out of it. The reason that I put somewhat of an asterisk next to Alabama is because they have Eli Ricks on there from going to LSU to Alabama, right? They have Jameer Gibbs going from Georgia Tech to Alabama, which makes sense. But they have Caden Proctor, who started his entire freshman season at Alabama, transferred to Iowa this offseason, never participated in any football activity, and then transferred right back to Alabama, right? If he's even done it yet. I don't even think he's officially transferred back to Alabama, but I'm not sure, you know, how that works or how they're getting around it, whatever, right? So Alabama essentially didn't get a transfer out of the portal. They just convinced Caden Proctor to come back, right? So I think, maybe I'm biased, it's locked on Longhorns, Texas stands alone at the top of the list at three top 14 transfers to commit to this program since 2022, right? That is ridiculous, right? And it starts with Quinn Ewers. Number one on the list was Caleb Williams. No argument there, right? He's been the best player in the portal since 2022. But Quinn Ewers came in at number two on the list, having a 100 overall rating. But once again, he was ranked behind Caleb Williams. I think anytime you can go in the portal and get a franchise quarterback, you won, right? I think anytime you can go in the portal and get that, you've gotten return on investment immediately, right? I think anytime you can go in the portal and get a three-year starter, you won, right? Like that's immediate return on investment, regardless of how high or, you know, how great the production is, right? A three-year starter is a three-year starter. The fact that you've been able to get one of the best quarterbacks in college football, like you not only hit a home run, you hit a grand slam, right? You're talking about Quinn Ewers, in two years at Texas, he has 5,679 yards and 43 total touchdowns. Quinn Ewers has led Texas to their first top five road win in over a decade over Alabama, their first Big 12 championship since 2009, their first college football playoff appearance ever, and broke the record for the most passing yards in the Big 12 championship game. And going into his third year, Quinn Ewers is the co-favorite for the Heisman. He should be a lock to go first round and has Texas poised as a legitimate national championship contender so Quinn Ewers obviously was one of the highest rated players ever coming out of high school the Ohio State experiment did not work out but when he entered the portal he was one of the highest rated players in it right and when you went and got Quinn Ewers you had high expectations for him right based on the way he was rated out of high school and he has met and exceeded those expectations in some way right so not only did Texas go and get one of the best players we've ever seen enter the portal but they've got an elite return on investment from that player getting a franchise quarterback in Quinn Ewers and he has the ability to take things to the next level this season number eight on that list of 14 is Adonai Mitchell who was the third overall player in the 2023 transfer class and the 98 overall prior to coming to the University of Texas Adonai Mitchell won two championships at Georgia and shined in the brightest moments, especially in the college football playoffs, even though injuries limited his regular season potential, right? Or the numbers he could have put up at the University of Georgia. Also being in that type of offense, right? Where they featured the tight end and the running backs more than anything else. And I guess Lad McConkey in the slot, right? Probably limited uh, his potential a little bit as well. To be closer to his daughter, he transferred to the University of Texas. I'm sure, uh, you know, the comparison of offensive systems had a lot to do with it as well. And that decision to transfer the, to the University of Texas has made him millions, right? So it's an elite return on investment for Texas and what they got out of Adonai Mitchell, but also for Adonai Mitchell and what he got out of the University of Texas. In two seasons at Georgia, he had 38 catches combined. Last year, he had 55. In two seasons at Georgia, he had 560 yards combined. Last year, he had 845. In two seasons at Georgia, he scored seven touchdowns combined compared to 11 last season for the University of Texas. He led Texas to their first college football playoff appearance and continued his streak of five touchdown receptions in 
five college football playoff games, and he will be a first round pick in two weeks. So once again, you got an elite player out of the portal, but not only that, you got elite return on investment on that player. And then that player got elite return on investment for transferring to Texas and will forever for the entirety of his National Football League career represent the burnt orange and white. And then 10th on that list of 14 is a player that has not taken a snap for the University of Texas yet. Isaiah Bond is number 10 on the list, coming in as the number four overall player and number one wide receiver on the list in the 2024 class ahead of Evan Stewart, right, who, you know, once was committed to the University of Texas. So that tells you what evaluators think of Isaiah Bond and his potential impact. Isaiah Bond made one of the greatest plays in college football history with his fourth and 31 catch in the Iron Bowl that secured a spot in the college football playoffs and SEC championship game for the Alabama Crimson Tide. Uh, last year, he posted 48 catches for 668 yards and four touchdowns in a very run heavy offense led by Jalen Milrow, uh, where the passing game was inconsistent, <laughs> you know, at best. Right. And like Adonai Mitchell, Bond will post career highs in my opinion across the board at texas he'll definitely have more than 48 catches 668 yards and four touchdowns he might do that by the end of the georgia game <laughs> you know what i mean so once again like adonai mitchell mom will post career highs across the board at texas and put himself in position to be a very early nfl draft pick i think texas is going to get amazing return on investment on isaiah bond and once again he's going to get great return on investment by coming to texas and increasing his profitability especially going into the nfl by millions right and so those are just three of the top 14 rated transfers we've seen since 2022 but other transfers texas has gotten or expected high you know return on investment on is ryan watts you know at a time where uh there was a lot of inconsistency in the cornerback room i think he came in and solidified that room ryan watts was a really good player for us andrew makuba you just expect him to do what he's done the last three years at clemson if he does that at texas that's elite return on investment at the safety position trade more 22 and a half sacks the last two seasons if he's that player at the university of texas you won and then matthew golden what he can do in the kicking uh return game the punt return game um what he can do with the ball in his hands you know route running size physicality all of that he's just explosive right so you know when we talk about teams using the transfer portal right you have to to win at a high level in college football you know like steve sarkeesian said adapt or die but i think adapt doesn't even do steve sarkeesian and the staff justice for how well they have navigated uh nio and the transfer portal and the one-time transfer rule they have absolutely been dominant in the transfer portal since Steve Sarkeesian arrived to the University of Texas. And that's the reason that they're set up for sustained success for a long time. And one of the reasons they're a legitimate national championship contender in 2024. A quick word from our sponsors, and this may be an exercise in futility, but how can Texas become UConn? <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun. Today's episode of Locked On Longhorns is brought to you by, who was it brought to you by? It is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On and make your first bet an automatic win with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So um, watch the championship last night. You know, uh, undoubtedly, I think that the women's game had more appeal to it, but I just think that's really more so because of the storylines, like the women's teams and players had household names. And so, you know, with basketball, like we don't really discuss basketball, like with football, we discuss football, right? Like with baseball, we discuss baseball, but like with basketball, we discuss like legacies and narratives. That's what moves the needle more in basketball discourse than like actually what happens on the court. And so when people say that the women's tournament was more interesting than the men's, what they're really saying is that they had women that they could incorporate their dumb, you know, legacy and narrative talk into, right? Like, is Caitlin Clark the GOAT, right? Is Caitlin Clark not the GOAT because she didn't win a championship? Juju, is Juju better than Caitlin Clark? Is Paige better than Caitlin Clark? Angel, you know, like, like, that's why the women's game was more entertaining to people 
because they had narratives and agendas attached to it, right? Where the men's was just hoops. Like, who are, whose legacy we're going to discuss in men's college basketball? Zach Eady. You know what I mean? Like, and I love Zach Eady. I'm a huge fan. Like, that's, that was no disrespect to him. But I'm just saying, like, we didn't have the superstar, you know, the name power or the household names in men's college basketball that the women's did. So I think that it was quality hoops being played, you know, but in basketball, hoops aren't discussed, right? We discuss narratives, you know, legacies and agendas. And all of those conversations were on the women's side this year, not the men's. But, you know, I just had to get that out the way. What UConn has done the last two years is one of the most impressive runs we've ever seen in college athletics. And I think it's one of the most impressive runs we've seen in sports, period. Now, I know it's still fresh. You know what I mean? It may not be we may not be able to, like, fully um, appreciate what they've done over the last two years. But to go into a single elimination tournament, right, where anything can happen at any point. To win 12 straight games in a win or go home type of environment in six different neutral sites and win all of those games by double digits, at least 13 points or more, that's just insane to me, right? And, and it, I don't even know if it'll land on people how insane it is right now. I think it'll take some time, right, to realize what UConn has done over the last two years in a tournament where anything can happen. And I used to, you know, say as long as a team gets to the Sweet 16, regardless of how talented they are, I really can't blame them because in a one game scenario, you could just be completely off. You could have to deal with injuries. You could have a bad matchup. The other team, like we saw against Kentucky, could just shoot lights out from three and there's literally nothing you can do. But somehow, UConn for 12 straight games over a span of two years, right, with different rosters, you know, has found a way to overcome all of that. And I just think it has to be one of the most legendary runs we've seen in sports, period, definitely in, you know, college athletics and certainly in men's college basketball. I'm not sure if we'll ever see another run like this or if we've ever seen a run prior to what UConn has been able to do over the last two seasons. And so you ask the question, how can you be UConn, right, or how can a program replicate the success that UConn has had over the last two seasons. And that's going to be tough, right? But obviously UConn found a way to do it. They found a way to make the tournament essentially anything can happen proof, right? <laughs> because they've gone into it the last two years and won every single game by double digits, right? So it's like, obviously anything can't happen, right? If you're prepared enough and you have the right players, and you have the right coaches to have, and clearly UConn does. I think what UConn has that nobody else has won first is – a defensive system within itself, right? Donovan Klingon is a 7-2 big with a 7-7 seven, seven wingspan that is an elite rim protector, right? Like he's taken away almost everything at the rim, right? You know, aside from the fact that Zach Eady went off last night, right? But that was just how he was playing defense. But he takes away almost everything at the rim, right? While also having the foot speed, length, and athleticism to cover out on the perimeter if need be. Like now, obviously, he's not going to be your primary defender on a point guard, but if UConn wants to switch, they can switch because Donovan Klingon can make that switch and handle his own. I believe that he's not the defender that Anthony Davis is, but he's the closest thing we have seen to a one man defensive system in college basketball. Since Anthony Davis. Right. And it's no secret that those players spent three years in college basketball and won three national championships between Anthony Davis and now Donovan Klingon, assuming he you know, enters the NBA draft. Donovan Klingon is a defensive system within himself, right, at 7'2 with a 7'7 seven, seven wingspan. And I think he's the most impactful defender we've had in college basketball, maybe outside of, you know, Davion Mitchell for Baylor at the guard position. But he just does so much more at the rim. I would have to say Donovan Klingon since Anthony Davis. Not the defender that Anthony Davis is, but that level of impact, right? And it's crazy that Calipari, with all the NBA talent, has only won the one year he had Anthony Davis, right? Donovan Klingon has that level of impact on the defensive end. An amazing screen setter, right? He sets 30 to 40 screens a game, right, which opens up everything else in UConn's offense. And he has great touch around the rim. So, you know, he's 7'2". <laughs> if nothing else on the offense is working, you could just dump it down to him in the post. And he has great touch around the rim. That's an easy basket, a uh, high percentage basket every time. And he can pass out of the double. And he's a willing passer. So if you try to double team him, he's 7'2". He can see over you. And he can make the pass. And everybody on UConn can shoot threes, right? So I think the biggest key is Donovan Klingon. And I think the biggest key about him is that he's a defensive system within himself. Two years at UConn, they won two national championships, right? <laughs> you know? Once again, it's because Donovan Klingon's defensive impact uh, impact we have not seen in college basketball since Anthony Davis. Tristan Newton, right, first-team All-American point guard. And how he started his career at East Carolina, 
is crazy to me. But an experienced point guard that's always in control, can get his own shot whenever he wants on any given night. He's a threat to give you 25 points or 12 assists, right? He can do that on any given night. And on some nights he can do both, right? A knockdown three-point shooter from range, but also can get to the rim at will. Last night we saw him shooting 28 foot threes and also taking Zach Eady to the rack, switching it to the left hand, putting it over him with touch. I mean, a first team All-American point guard, <laughs> really like Tristan Newton. I mean, it's just an amazing player, a floor general that gets everybody involved. He's just so poised off the pick and roll, off the drive, and he makes the right decision almost every single time, right? Texas definitely hasn't had a player like Donovan Klingon, but who has? But even a player like Tristan Newton, right, that is that poised, that composed, that much of a threat scoring and passing the ball at the guard position and that much of a floor general and a leader. Texas hasn't had a player like that in a long time. And we've had two really good point guards and Marcus Carr and Max Aismas recently. And Tristan Newton is on another level compared to those players. Cam Spencer, a fiery competitor that has an automatic jumper, especially from the three point line, competes, defends and knocks down open shots. Right. Three and D, but it's a little bit more than that. Right. And everybody needs a player like that. But seriously, somebody that's, you know, a threat to knock down almost every three they take and can shoot 40 percent from the three um, in high leverage situations. Right. Not just like 40 percent from three over the season. But when the game is in the balance, when you're in the national championship game and you need a huge three, Cam Spencer is just that type of player. Stefan Castle, a high level on ball defender, a five star out of high school that can eliminate the best player, get to the rim at will and make the right pass when it presents itself. So he's just a low maintenance, um, you know, high leverage player for UConn that completely took Braden Smith out of the game last night. And then Alex Caravan, you have a six, eight stretch forward that can score inside, can shoot the mid range and the three can put the ball on the floor to initiate the offense and at times can guard three to five. So that is UConn starting five, right? They did just win a national championship with and blew out six straight teams in the tournament with. They have playmaking, player movement, ball movement, three-point shooting, on-ball defense, team defense, size, length, and athleticism. They have literally everything you need to succeed in this era of modern basketball. So, you know, my entire life, I've talked about the NCAA tournament, like it's a crapshoot and like anything can happen. And you can't necessarily judge, you know, coaches based on the success they have in the tournament because in a one-game scenario, anything can happen. UConn is proving <laughs> – Right. That you can eliminate the what ifs. Right. And you can eliminate the surprises. You can just be so good that even in a sport like college basketball, where there's so much parity, you can go into a tournament for two straight years, win 12 straight games and win all of those games by double digits. So, you know, this doesn't have to be Texas's path to a national championship. You don't have to have a roster that's as stacked and as versatile like this, you know, that UConn has, because once again, anything can happen in, you know, a one game scenario. Trey Johnson could average 35 in the tournament next year and we can win a national championship. But I think we have never seen a team as complete as UConn. And it makes sense that we have never seen a team dominate in the tournament in a two year span, I guess, since, you know, UCLA and you know Kareem Abdul-Jabbar because of the way that they have built their roster. And so if Texas wants to, you know, compete on the level of UConn, which they're a long way away from, you need an elite you know, a player that can be a defensive system within itself. You need one of the best point guards in the country. Uh, you need a player that can shoot the lights out from three. You need a stretch four that can do a little bit of everything, right? And then uh, you need a high level on ball defender that can be one of the best defenders in the country and take damn near every player's best player away. So Texas right now really doesn't have any of that. And UConn has all of that. Right? And that's why they're 12 and 0 at the last two NCAA tournaments, winning all of those games by 13 points or more. And why Texas who has been really exciting the last two seasons, has a long way to go to win their first national championship. A quick word from our sponsors. And i talk about what the Texas women's basketball team needs to do to put themselves in this position next season. All right, get out of here talking about um, the women's basketball team. You know, congratulations to South Carolina. Uh, you know, going 38 and 0. Um, I think they had an average margin of victory throughout the season of like 24 points, which is just insane. Um, only one loss uh, over the last two years, and it might be to the greatest women's basketball player we've ever seen. I um, mean, Caitlin Clark, and of course, shout out to you know the Iowa basketball team. I went to high school in Iowa. You see, I'm rocking the black and yellow today, so you know, special place in my heart for you know the Iowa basketball team. Um, but seriously, you know, they just done so much as a whole. You know, South Carolina. Um, LSU, Iowa, all of these players, all of these coaches, uh, even, you know, ESPN and the media, right? When you talk about, um, you know, Andrea Carter, Chine Agumike, um, and 
L. Duncan, right? Like they've just so many people um, are responsible for this upsurge in interest in women's college basketball, women's basketball period. You know, I've talked about how Vic Schaefer and Madison Booker have really made me a fan of the game, right? Because Madison Booker reminded me so much of Kevin Durant that made me want to watch, you know, women's college basketball more and more, right? So, so many people responsible for just a historic season in college basketball, um, women's college basketball, and I'm sad it's over, right? But I'm very excited for next season. I'm very excited for a team like Texas to see if they can take that next step because they were a one seed you know this year and they were one of two one seeds to not get to the final four right texas lost to nc state and then usc lost to yukon right and i don't think that texas should have lost to nc state yukon they have Paige beckers they have nothing but five stars on their roster they were a three seed you know i went into that game saying they were a better team than usc right usc was just the higher seed but Texas was a better team than NC State. And unfortunately, they lost that game and could not get to the final four. But next year, a lot of people expect this Texas team to be better. And, you know, we pose the question, will this be the year they made it to the final four? But will this be the year they get back to the final four or to the national championship game? Right. I think the biggest contenders for that next season will be South Carolina. Obviously, one again. I mean, you know, obviously, once again, um, the only player that they're for sure losing is Camilo Cardoso. Cardoso and that's a huge loss because she's six, seven. Right. But I think pretty much everybody else on that team, they're bringing back Tahina Pow Pow, uh, who shot 45 percent from three this year, is a senior. Right. But she has COVID year eligibility. And I think I might have seen somewhere that she's potentially coming back. Uh, so South Carolina is going to be a dog okay, next year. Right. And they have the number two overall player in the country coming in as a freshman. And we saw how well they you know, utilized freshmen this year with Malaysia uh, Fawali and Tessa Johnson. So South Carolina is going to be the standard of women's college basketball again next year. Um, might go undefeated you know, or something close to it. And they're certainly going to be the favorites to win the national championship. USC, you know, with Juju Watkins, she's a top three, top four player in the sport. And that definitely moves the needle, especially in women's college basketball. They've also brought in a really good recruiting class. They've shown the ability to navigate the transfer portal really well. And now that's a program that's being invested in in terms of NIL support and all of that. Right. So USC is a legitimate national championship contender. Um, I think Notre Dame. You know, I think Notre Dame with great coaching. They're one of the few programs that's won a championship in the midst of all this dominance between uh, UConn and uh, South Carolina. You know, they have so much uh, history in that program. Right. I think right now with, uh, you know, Sonia Citron, uh, Maddie Westbuild and Hannah Hidalgo, they have a really good chance to come back next season and be a force, especially under Coach Ivy. So there might be like a dark horse, but I think that's a team that can compete for a national championship next year. And then UConn, right? Ozzie Fudd, Paige Becker's coming back. Um, I think they just got a commitment from the number one overall player in the country in the 2024 class. Their entire, you know, rotation is five stars, right? And then, of course, you got, you know, Gino Uriema, who's won 11 championships at UConn, which is just insane. So um, those are the four teams outside of Texas that I could see winning a national championship next year. I think the teams like, you know, NC State will be really good again. Obviously, you know, Iowa will be good. Iowa State, Stanford. But as far as teams that can win a national championship, I got South Carolina, USC, UConn, Notre Dame, and then Texas, right? When you look at what Texas is bringing back, Rory Harmon, um, who's coming back, your veteran leader, your point guard, who's a three-level scorer and facilitator, Madison Booker, who's proved to be one of the best scorers, maybe has the best mid-range jumper in women's college basketball, and does a really good job of getting her teammates involved, definitely a young superstar in the sport. So I think with Rory Harmon and Madison Booker, you have two top 10 players in women's college basketball, right? Then you have Shea Holly, who's your glue, right? You're Brock Cunningham of the team without all the craziness, but seriously, 3 and D, she does it at such a high level. She's coming back. Aaliyah Moore, right? A two-level scorer. And I think she can, you know, pop out and knock down the three if she needed to. But, um, you know, definitely somebody that, you know, in the uh, paint or, you know, in the mid-range and that, that, you know, kind of mid-post jumper area uh, can put the ball in the basket, also can rebound for you. So those are the four players you for sure are coming back from last year's rotation. Then you're bringing in two five stars who are ranked seventh and eighth in their class, respectively, in Justice, Justice Carlton and Jordan Lee, two McDonald's All-Americans. You have Khadijah Fay and Deanna Gaston that can use their COVID year. Not sure if they'll come back or not, but that would be good depth in the post. And then Taylor Jones cannot return. This was her fifth and final year of college basketball. So I think right now you have a clear cut rotation of six, right? With Rory, Madison Booker, Shea Holly, Aaliyah Moore, Justice Carlton and Jordan Lee, right? the two freshman five stars. Then you got Khadijah Faye and Deanna Gaston that could come back and that would be really solid depth in the post, right? I think you need another legitimate score in the post, especially because you're losing Taylor Jones. And I think you need another player that is a knockdown three-point shooter, right? Texas needs to 
become a team that can win from the three point line. Right. And you need to go out and get somebody in the portal that can come in and knock down threes. Right. Especially in high leverage situations, because when Texas played their most important games, they could knock down three. They could not knock down threes. And their designated three point shooters, Shea Holly and Shaylee Gonzalez, were very inconsistent. Right. You need to go out and get somebody in the portal that can shoot the three at a high level. But you also need to make that a foundation of your basketball team. We are going to shoot and make a lot of threes, right? Because that's how you're competitive in today's era of college basketball. So I love the skeleton of this roster. Once again, I think you need to add some high level uh, post play, whether it be depth or somebody to play next to a Leah Moore, and you need to add another high level shooter out of the portal. But I definitely think Texas is one of the five for me, national championship contenders going into next season of women's college basketball. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.